Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Thanks for joining us. We have an awful lot to talk about this week, as usual. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write to politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and please tell us where you're from. The episode today is sponsored by Blinkist, HelloFresh, and Songfinch. Please check out their links in the show notes, and we thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. How are you, James? Uh, Hi, am I? Uh, I'm pretty good. Uh, You know, watching everything, no one rest easy in this world right now. But, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon's 66-page letter saying that the economy was going to be strong for the next couple of years is, I don't know, I guess it's encouraging to, to some extent. Uh, you know, we had a big uh, Nationals win on opening day. So, you know, on the yeah. whole, uh, I love that. I love that Nationals we had win. Before. Yeah. Went out for brunch with my kids on Sunday uh, outdoors. So it's nice. James, you know, though, we, you know, we talk all the time and every now and then we have to explain to each other what's happening. So I want to tell you why we've gotten it wrong on the Georgia voting law. And this is thanks to Republican Governor Brian Kemp. Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, and others, they've explained what it really is. You see, Georgia voted for a Democratic presidential candidate for the first time in 28 years, and they elected two Democratic senators, and this was due to a surge in voting among blacks. So the Republicans in the Georgia legislature, now now, now you got to follow this, they decided that what they wanted to do was pass a law that expands voting rights, that makes it easier for blacks to vote, kind of like the state version of the 1965 Civil Rights Act. J- James, uh, are you really moved by this act of selflessness by the right wing Georgia legislature? Much more than you could imagine. They got up collectively one morning, six o'clock, and somebody drafted a 98 page bill. And they were so moved by the franchise, the access to the franchise, the, the fairness of it all that the House passed it like 9 o'clock in the morning. And then the Senate was so moved, they weren't going to fool anything like hearings. This was, this was an expansion of the 15th Amendment. And so they passed it at noon. And the governor, in his infant wisdom, calls in six other old white guys, and they stand under a painting of a plantation of which they do not let a duly elected state senator in the room, in fact, have her arrested. And what they're trying to do is they're just trying to help black people. And if you just quit complaining and whining and carping and understand that the Georgia Republican Party really has an interest that your right to vote and we want to be sure that you have it, trust us. It is the most crock of crap stuff I've ever heard in my life, in my entire life. And they're whining, squealing like a stuck pig. And I think the Democrats ought to just keep pouring the heat on. Yeah, I, really I agree. It's, it's outrageous. Listen, no, I, James, you're right. Uh, the president made it's just a, like, it's just an unfortunate mistake, and he charged the law was cutting back in early voting, which it doesn't, except for runoffs. But it does engage in massive vote suppression. It makes it harder to get absentee ballots, which were used more by blacks than whites in 2020 for the first time, and it makes it harder in Senate runoff elections. Uh, and the worst of all, and what they don't want, talk about is it lets the right-wing Georgia legislature suspend county election officials and overturn the rules. Now, if that had been in effect last November, do you have any doubt that they would have done Trump's bidding and stolen the election? Of course they would have. Uh, So this is really a terrible bill and a terrible law. It's vote suppression. Trump, or I I think President Biden, unfortunately, got the provision wrong that's bad. But I'll tell you what infuriated me. Uh, Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich, great Trump sycophants for four years, said that that Biden was a liar about the Georgia law. To be called a liar by Newt Gingrich and Chris Christie, James, is sort of like being called ugly by a frog. Yeah, I I, I mean, does anybody, of course, Newt Gingrich and Chris Christie, they're, they're two people that get up every morning thinking about how can we do something to help empower and franchise people? So their voice can be heard in America, because that's all that Newt Gingrich and Chris Christie 
have worried about in their entire lives is how do you get marginal people to become middle class people? And how do you listen to the voices of people that have been historically marginalized? How do you do that? Because that's really what Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich are about. Well, it's mostly about cheeseburgers, but that's high up on the list. It's that, that these people can go out and give a rant with this kind of crock of crap stuff is, is just unbelievable. It, it really is. And so that that's old Newt, man. He he's really trying to expand the franchise. He's 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 really a friend of the downtrodden. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> please, people, please. Yeah, and I, I think they, 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 I'll give me credit. credit. Keep they just the go out there. Of... Yes. Don't let up. Don't let up. It's a it's a right. winning right. political. Don't let up. Right. Yeah. And and for whatever their reasons, I think Major League Baseball was right in moving the All-Star game. I know some people are upset about it. Some people say it's not a strategically smart move. I'm sorry. If they hadn't done that in North Carolina in 2016, the NCAA and the uh, NBA All-Star game, uh, uh, those crackers never, never would have changed the bathroom law. I don't know they're going to change this law, but keep the heat on. Keep it on all the time and keep the pressure on in Texas and Florida and other places where they're engaged in what is demonstrable voter suppression. Oh, it's, it's, it, so we're having these terrible inequality problems. We're having these terrible, you know, echo effect from systemic racism that has like plagued this country. And we're going to try to stop people who've been a victim of this of voting. It, it's so outrageous. It, it's, in, in the, the fact that they come out and like what a, I don't know, a straight face is the word, that they can come out and say, well, gee, people, we were just trying to help here. Oh, yeah. my God. It's, just, it, it, it's mm. sickening. It's really sickening. We want to expand voting rights. Yes. Yeah, that's what we fall. We, we want more fairness. We don't want less. Yeah. And of course, as right. Justin Roberts told us, there's no racism left in America. So what are you people worried right. about? Just like, right. it's all gone. It's a big, big, giant mistake. We now know it, and we've moved on from that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you're right. I think it's a winning issue. I think keep at it. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the president has to be careful what he says. That, he had made very many yeah. mistakes. Uh, and that was uh, not, not an intentional one. It, Still can't get it. Was not, it was not like a good Richard one. Christie. Got to learn from it. Yeah. 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 You do. You do. But these guys like yeah. Newt and Chris Christie, who defended the worst line we have ever seen, the most worst malfeasance. You know, and turn to blind, blind eye now to suddenly get holier than thou. But that's you're right. That's what we expect from them. Uh, I think I, that I, uh, I want to see them too in a wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> God, Chris yeah. Christie and Newt Gingrich in a wet that'll, t-shirt contest. Oh, that, that'll, that'll uh, cheer I, you. I, I can't lot, even visualize man. it. <laughs> uh, James, I I had a uh, I had a scare this week. I have to tell you. I misread a story, and I thought that Congressman Matt Gass was resigning. And, and I really thought that was, you know, I didn't want that to happen because I was really loving this story, uh, even though I have great, great uh, uh, empathy and support for the, the victims here. This is the sex scandal Trump-loving Florida Republican. It's a story that keeps giving. Uh, he allegedly transported underage girls across state lines. He then showed nude photos to his Republican colleagues on the House floor bragging about his conquest. And I, according to one report, at least, in the New York Times, he asked Trump for a blanket pardon. And you know what? I don't see, I don't see Republicans doing much about him. Kevin McCarthy says, well, let's see how it plays out. We know. That's for the criminal courts to decide. We know how it plays out. He's a total despicable bum. Well, how would you like that your daughter has a new date and knocks on the door and you open the front door and Matt gets is standing there. <laughs> you immediately go to the bathroom and throw up. I mean, you can look, that guy has got perv stamped right across his fork. I, 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 he really does. I mean, he is the weirdest looking guy. He is the weirdest guy. Is anybody really surprised about this? And it, is anybody going to be surprised when they just keep digging this stuff up, or which they're going to dig a lot more up than, than people can imagine? And, you know, he's a guy, his daddy was a powerful guy. The story is apparently not a terrible human being. 
who did what most parents do, got his son, bailed his son out of trouble. He got like drunk driving tickets or something like that. And he led a privileged life. And he is a weird, strange guy, man. He is really, really weird. And he is really strange. And I can't get enough of this story. Yeah, I agree. He's repulsive. The only reason he's staying in Congress is because it gives him, he thinks, I'm sure, some leverage in bargaining. You know, he's going to end up uh, having a plea bargain. And I think he thinks, maybe correctly, that he's got a lot more leverage uh, by promising to resign than he does if he's a former member of Congress. But whatever it is, I think that uh, I think that Mr. Getz is likely to <clears throat> have to be fitted for an orange jumpsuit before this is over. Well, I, I... You know, when you told me that that uh, he he was going to resign, my reaction was, yeah. "Oh no, don't tell me that." And so no, I misread the story. I, I, I oh, want to matter oh. a little bit. You know, he'll get out on bail. Hey. And it's not going to be a trial because he's going to plead because he's it's just the way that it works. But it, it, again, how did any? How could you not tell? <laughs> you know, is anybody yeah. surprised by this? No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah, and again, uh, I he has. I I don't think you should. Uh, I don't think you should uh, evict members of Congress who are duly elected, other than after they've been convicted of something. But I think that for Kevin McCarthy and those Republicans, they ought to take away his committee assignments. They ought to denounce him. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's. It, it's up to a court of law to decide whether he engaged in criminal acts. We know what kind of acts he engaged in. Uh, and they are not worthy uh, of a member of Congress, and uh, they ought to be some sanctions yeah, against I, him. But politically, I hope he's. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I, I guess he's entitled to due process, and the longer he stays out there, yeah. the more I like it. I don't want him to go away. I want to see <laughs> a lot. I'm not. I don't want him. To, the only way I want him to go away if if he's is guilty of the things that that people are investigating. Then he needs to go away. But let's let the investigation run its course. I see agree. He's really I agree. guilty, um, of. but he is—he is one. He is, he is a perv. I can tell you that. That I'm confident of. I don't know if it's a you know. What else you got in your mind, James? Be a criminal. Oh, <laughs> what else I got in my mind? I—I I, I tell you, I think it was a significant thing. I, I did Bill Crystal's podcast, and. He, he said, you know, what is it that's something that people look at in polls that, that most people don't? And I said, self-identified party ID is probably the most important question. And I said, you know, I'd seen a couple of polls that looked pretty good for Democrats, but, you know, I don't jump to a conclusion. And then, lo and behold, I look on Drudge, and Gallup has the Democratic Party the highest it's been since 2012. And it's just something, if I could take our audience inside, is the press, a lot of people missed the story. They said 85% of the Republicans support Trump. Okay, that's fine. But 85% of 42% or 85% of 36% is a significantly different number. And I, I think we ought to continue looking at this party ID number because I, I just in the back of my mind remember seeing it. And it's become like a headline Gallup number. And I, I, I think what's happening here, I, I, don't, I don't want to say it, I'm, I'm sure, but I, I think Trump's deteriorating. I think his position is deteriorating and he's deteriorated a lot since, for sure, since January the 6th. And it's still strong. It's still dominant. He's still the dominant figure in the Republican Party, but much less so. And if these trends continue, it's going to be a much smaller Republican Party than we've dealt with. So I, I think that's something that we well, should I mean, pay attention <clears throat> to. We should revisit because, hey, the trend could change. We could be at some outlier numbers. We don't know for sure. But it's, I think it's worth looking at. I do, too. And the import is is really relevant for the 22 House elections. If this keeps up, if this continues, and we don't know if it will, I think the odds right now are clearly that the Republicans will take back the House. They'll pick up some from redistricting. They may enact some of these suppression laws. They have history on, on their side. And all they have to do is win four or five seats. But if this keeps up, <clears throat> and that gap, that favorability gap between Democrats and Republicans continues, and the Republicans still were thought of as the Trump party, I think that significantly increases 
the Democrats' chances of keeping the House. You can say what you want about Goldman Sachs or Jamie Dimon, but neither one are idiots. And they both think Goldman Sachs are because they have eight, over 8% 8 growth here. And then Jamie is talking about the same thing in the 66 page letter. If that's true, then we'll keep the house. <laughs> we'll expand it. I mean, if you grow, if we've never seen growth like we, we get, like we're seeing. Now, maybe inflation comes, maybe the whole thing comes crashing down. We're at war with China, any of that. But if, if this is right, they can redistrict away. It's going to be a pretty, pretty good deal for Democrats. It is. And it's one of, in the short term, one of the great Republican talking points against the Biden infrastructure tax proposals is this is the worst time in the world during this downturn to increase taxes. I want to tell you something. Uh, those tax increases wouldn't, will take effect if they are enacted in a booming economy. That's exactly the time that you ought to think about some kind of tax increases to pay for investments like infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like it, what's a good time to get venereal disease? There's no good time. That's, I said, it's, when's a good time to get syphilis? Well, there is no good time to get it. Well, that, uh, the tax increases are not syphilis. I've got news for you. <laughs> they can produce revenue. Uh, they, they can deal with on the margins with inequality, which are two huge issues. And uh, I'm not bothered in the least by this. But, of course, they're never going to say Yeah, I'm not either. Taxes. But everybody's caught on to that. Hey, James, when you don't have free time, you can't read or work on personal development. These are busy times for all of us. Let me tell you about our ultimate life hack for learning new things and getting ahead. It's an incredible app that solves this problem. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways for busy people like you, collecting them from thousands of nonfiction books and condensing them down into just 15 minutes. There's everything from self-help to business health, and history, along with the latest titles from the bestseller list and classic nonfiction titles you always meant to read, but you never had time to. Maybe I can go back and read Chaucer. James, what do you think? Well, I'm not going to go back and read Chaucer. I remember one time I, I tried to read uh, Ulysses. I'm not like, I don't have any idea what they're saying. But what you can do, that, that behind Ulysses, is behind the sound and the fury, behind all of this, is a real compelling story. And when you do Blinkist, they'll explain the story to you. This yeah. is like crack. Once you're on this, it's hard to get off of. I'm just telling you, my caveat, once you start reading this stuff, you, you, it's, it's addictive because it, it, it's that explanatory and it, it gives you some sense of like, gee, I'm smart. I know, I understand this now. Yeah, and you can sound smart wherever you go. Right. Uh, not that I go anywhere, but if I do, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sound smarter. Two of our recent favorites are Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations by William H. McRaven and Untrumping America by Dan Pfeiffer. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash War Room to try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash War Room, all one word, to start your free trial. And you'll also save 25% off, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash War Room. You also can look for the link in our show notes. Yeah, I, I mean, those two books just stand out. Of course, Adam Ward Raven, head of the Navy SEALs and president of, you know, University of Texas, one of the most prestigious and large universities in the world. And Dan Pfeiffer's book is, is really, he, he's a very smart guy. And I've been reading a lot about it. And those are two pretty good picks that, that they got. They, both, both of them, I think, are important books. Okay, welcome back, uh, James. Joe Manchin from West Virginia, uh, the 50th Democratic vote, if you will, in the Senate, dealt a seeming blow to Biden and other Democrats with an Washington Post op-ed where he declared he won't accept any modification of the filibuster and said, let's put together bipartisan deals on voting rights and infrastructure instead. 
If he can get 10 Republicans to support a voting rights bill that stops this voter suppression that's going on in states like Georgia and attempted in Florida and Texas, fine. I doubt very much he can. If they have to take out some other parts of the bill, that's okay. But if, if, if he can't get 10 Republicans to vote for a bill that genuinely creates federal standards that does not allow them to suppress voters, it's aimed at blacks, uh, then I hope Joe Manchin will then be amenable to a workaround. I don't know what you do about infrastructure because any Republican deal will be a very limited deal, won't be anything close to what, what one could get. Uh, Roy Blunt, for instance, said, let's take it instead of two, two trillion, let's take it down to 600 million and get rid of all the extraneous measures. Well, one of the extraneous measures, the biggest as a matter of fact, $400 billion for, to help in-care home for seniors and people with disabilities. Roy Blunt may consider that extraneous. Uh, I don't. I don't think most Americans do. But he, he may really have put Biden and Schumer in a jam, James. He very well could. And he, he always had that power. Uh, I'm hoping yeah. that he's, you know, six weeks from now, eight weeks from now, he says, I've tried everything I could. I'm, I'm just exhausted to no end. But I'm not going to use this one occasion to protect most sacred right Americans have right to vote. I'm hoping that's what it is. I don't know if it's that. Uh, it's really a shame that, that we're this close to passing something this meaningful and this necessary. I, I, you know, I think the President yeah. Biden will keep the lines of communications open. You know? Yeah, I, I do too. And um, look, I have reservations about a total end of the filibuster. I mean, I really do. I'm not one of those who said, you know, let's do away with it. Um, I'm even ambivalent because I know what Republicans might do if they have control with a total end of the filibuster. However, uh, I do think you need modifications and you need a workaround on this voting rights measure. And uh, Joe Manchin, I, I really do believe he's, he represents a state that's overwhelmingly red now, but I think he is at, at core a Democrat. And I think he has to realize what great harm this would do if Congress is unable to pass a voting rights measure. And I guess I'm cautiously optimistic now that on this one, he'll come around. I don't know about infrastructure. I think that's much harder. Yeah, I, I, presumably, I mean, I don't suppose to know what, what he's thinking or what's going on. I do know this, that he's running in a state that a Democrat hadn't carried a county since 2008, which probably means that he needs to create some space. I, I hope that's what he's doing now is creating some space and pushback and then saying it's just too unreasonable. I, I, I don't know. And uh, there's some chance you might be able to get some infrastructure votes because there's some chance they'll want some of these projects in their states. But, you know, remember, we don't have much of a House majority either. I mean, we're running, you know, on some pretty, pretty slim margins here right now. And uh, I think that there might be a little bit Democratic giddiness. I, I think this Manchin announcement uh, toned that getting this down a little bit. And, you know, the reality is we got, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of baseball left here. <laughs> right. Before we have infrastructure, right. Right. voting rights, anything else. No, uh, and I, I, it is, it's a, it's a dash of cold water in the face, if you will. Uh, the House majority it was, un the fragility of the House majority was under, scored when the Florida Congressman L.C. Hastings died this week. Uh, at this stage, now there'll be some special elections in the next couple of weeks, including one in your state. Yeah. But at this stage, I think she can only afford to lose two votes uh, and uh, and still have a majority. I, I worried when there were a number of members of the House who were appointed to cabinet posts that that was going to cause problems. I hope we get through and get all these special elections uh, finished before there's a key vote. But that that's a very, very thin margin. And there are members uh, who say they don't want some of the more liberal provisions in this bill. They're going to have to cut back on any kind of infrastructure. If they cut back reasonably, I, I, the number doesn't matter as much as the specifics, uh, then that'll be OK. But if they really take it down to something like Roy Bunch talking about, that's a that's a, you know, a pretty uh, really a, a huge lost opportunity. Yeah, I, I, this Louisiana Second Congressional District race is, is more going to tell us more than people think. 
And first of all, both are Democrats, both are Black Democrats. I, I doubt if either one would vote very much differently, but the way that it's being set up is Karen Carter Peterson is a former state Democratic Party chair, former state senator. Dad was a, a respected uh, New Orleans pal. And, uh, but she's running as the Emily's List, uh, Stacey Abrams, you know, and I think Donna Brazil is like in Dawson. And she's running as a kind of national leader, you know, at some of these groups. And uh, her opponent is a male by the name of Troy Carter, who was on the New Orleans City Council, then was in the state house, and now he's in the state senate. And he did something else. I think it was something else along the way. And he's running the kind of bread and butter. He had the endorsement of Cedric Richmond, who's now in the White House. And he's running more of a bread and butter people issues campaign. So it, 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 it's going to be interesting to see how, how this turns out. It's about a 63% black district. And some there's some affluent whites in that district, too. So it, uh, it, it, the return is just going to say a little bit where the Democratic Party is. And, you know, yeah. particularly with Southern Blacks, which are you know, key, key constituents in the Democratic Party. So I think the race is actually a little more, it's a little more national politics at stake than people would think at first blush. Not a lot, but a little bit. And that election, what, James, is it the 24th of April? I want to say it's the 25th, but it's the 24th or 25th. Is it? Okay. Whatever, it's Saturday. Well, we will follow it uh, next week for sure. L let me just make one other point about this infrastructure bill. We talk about the infrastructure bill. It's an infrastructure and it's a tax bill. And that's where Republicans really go ballistic. James, let me say something that is going to make my dear late friend, Robert Novak, perhaps pop out of his coffin. We are not an overtaxed country. In fact, compared to most other countries, we are an undertaxed country, both in the federal level and overall. And uh, we are taxed less as a percentage of GDP than we were 20 years ago. Corporate taxes only comprise 7% of federal revenues, down a great deal. But, you know, Republicans uh, will keep hammering away at that, at that socialistic tax policies. It's utter bunk. But I don't think Joe Manchin is going to find any compromise there. They want to take the corporate tax. They want to take it at 25% rather than 28, down to 21 then, then okay, fine. I, you know, if they can make it up elsewhere, it's not that big a deal. I would just remind that four years ago, corporate America, five years ago, was dying for a 28% rate. Uh, and Trump took it to 21 because he's Trump. And uh, if they have to compromise on that, that's fine. But if it's no taxes at all, uh, which is what most Republicans will say, uh, Joe Manchin has got a got a heap of, uh, of dealing to do. Yeah, I, we should... Uh asked Roger Altman about this, but uh, I've heard a proposal, and it kind of made me sure there's something wrong with it, but it, it, it makes sense to me. Abolish the corporate income tax. All right? Mm -hmm. and then, but but you pay, people pay capital gains uh, is ordinary income. You know, so when they distribute the profits, then their tax is, is, is ordinary income. And, but so you tax it on 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 a distribution end, and so I don't I don't know. It, it, you could is there a way to simplify this and raise the revenue you, you need from, frankly, the people you need to raise the revenue from, right? right. And I, the, the answer is I, I, I'm sure there's something wrong with this idea. <laughs> no, you know I think it makes a great deal of economic sense. I don't know the particulars. Right. I think probably the biggest problem is political. You know, it's easy for people to understand, let's raise the corporate rate. The corporate rate is only 21%, let's take it up to 28 When you talk about base broadening, when you talk about, you know, treating capital gains, foreign source income, people sort of get lost. So I think substantively there's a lot of merit to that. We ought to ask Roger right. Altman. We ought to have Roger Altman on this show. In the yeah, next and show also in the you next tax month. dividends as ordinary income. So right. when, the, when the corporation you know, exactly. distributes its profits, then you tax it at that point. I, look, it, it it's too simple to be a good idea. But I've I've, I've heard it and I, I've thought about it, and just on the surface, it sounds like well, it might work because, and and I think that Secretary Yellen's idea for a global corporate tax is a good idea. 
Because with your family, and they'll move to Ireland or the Bahamas or, you know, the Seychelles or something like that and set it up. So I think some, and I think the world, you know, particularly the developed world is ready to embrace higher rates of taxation for corporations. I'm like that Dutch economist at a, a symposium on income inequalities, but you couldn't mention taxes. He said, well, that's like having a, a symposium on firefighting. You can't mention water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Okay? laughs> no, no, you're right. And I think, I think you're also right that they are, they are really moving, the industrial nations are really moving towards a minimum tax in order to, in order really to at least mitigate the effect of these tax havens. Uh, these companies locate multinationals in various countries. They really aren't headquartered there at all. They do it for tax purposes. So Yellen, I thought, thought gave a very good speech the other day. So we'll see. But Joe Manchin certainly changed the early dynamics of this, and we'll see how it yep. unfolds, James. Sure did. Now we want to take a minute to tell you about an awesome and delicious service that's perfect for the times. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients, and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh lets you skip trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Thanks to HelloFresh, eating healthier has never been easier with low-carb, carb-smart, vegetarian options every week. And no matter what you choose, Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. HelloFresh offers 25 plus recipes to choose from each week, from vegetarian meals to craft burgers and extra special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy with all recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. James may be as good as your uh, homemade tuna fish. Let me tell you something. This is a product that I can talk about. All right. I get it. All right. And I am, I, I, of course, I love bourbon, you know, and I, lo I like a lot of things that are not good for you. But I do eat a lot of produce. And these people are the best I have ever seen because they don't send you anything that's not in season from somewhere. And I, I used to always want to start an online company that said somebody somewhere in the world is eating a good tomato. Why aren't you? Right. And, and I've, I've gotten this before. And when I get settled down, I'm going to get it again on a regular basis. But this is a sterling product. It goes right to your door. They're fresh. You got really, really good variety. Some things you're going to find that you like better than other things. You can probably tailor it to, to some extent. But I have used this product and I, I do eat a lot of. Uh, in addition to all the bad stuff I do, I do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, outside of your own farmer's market, which is a very limited, in a very limited time, you can get stuff from around the country. I think they get stuff from around the world. And, and they're very, very meticulous about what they do and how fresh it is. And it's, it's just a first rank operation. They really are. So what you have to do, you go to HelloFresh.com slash War Room. One, two, and use code WARROOM12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash WARROOM12 and use code room WARROOM12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. For America's number one meal kit, remember. So go to HelloFresh.com slash WARROOM12 and use code WARROOM12. It's all one word. For 12 meals, including free shipping, you will be delighted. I agree. Uh, I agree. And maybe they'll throw a celery and red onion in one shipment so they can make, people can make my tuna for the <laughs> Yeah, but you're not going to get your bourbon, I'm afraid. But nah. anyways, it's great. Hey, James, now for one of our favorite segments. And appropriately enough, the first question comes from Nancy in New Orleans, and this is, has to be directed to you. She wants to discuss the political implications of the so-called jungle primary. She says they're in Georgia and Louisiana. I'm not sure that's right. But anyway, who benefits incumbents, challengers, or the entrenched party? Well, Nancy, you're right. It did exist in Georgia in terms of the election uh, 
between Kelly Laffer for the uninspired seat and, and, and Warnock. It, it, it was not true in, in the uh, Osaroff, uh purdue race. And I, 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 what they have also in Georgia is they have a runoff. You can run by party ID, but you have to get, you have to get over 50 in the first time. In Louisiana, it's a straight, what they call a jungle primary. The word is probably on a politically incorrect ban list, but at any rate, they, they, they call it. I think it's, I think it's, they're moving to that in California. I mean, no system is perfect, but it's, it's as good as any. I don't think, I don't hear any great desire to get rid of it in Louisiana. And in fact, California's starting to embrace it. And a lot of people think that it, it would encourage more moderate candidates. I don't know if that's true, but I'm sure we'll get some political science on that relatively soon. Yeah, but I, no, the I, idea is I, I totally agree brilliant and terrible. Thanks for the question, yeah. Andy. Well, we'll go all the way to Abu Dhabi now. And Bill, who is an expat college professor who votes absentee in Palm Beach, Florida. And he wants to know, nominate a couple likely Democratic Party candidates from Florida who could offer Marco Rubio a serious challenge in 2022. There are two members of Congress, both attractive. Val Demings, who was on the impeachment committee, Stephanie Murray, uh, Murphy, rather. Um, and I think they both could be potential candidates. The party, it's a very weak party. It hasn't produced great candidates. My outside candidate that's not going to happen, and I think you always look for this dream candidate who's never run before and think that he or she's going to be terrific, and they usually aren't. But I always thought that Grant Hill, uh, the former great basketball player at Duke and in the NBA, an incredibly smart, attractive guy, would have been a really strong candidate if he'd gone back to Florida where he's lived for the last 20 years. But he decided instead to take over the the job as the head of uh, uh, really the uh, 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 basketball, international basketball for the United States. But I think, you know, I don't think that Rubio is a shoe-in, a favorite, but not a shoe-in. So Florida is my pet peeve. So in the state of Florida in 2018, 64% of Floridians voting. It's not a poll, okay? It's not a yeah, poll. This is actually voted on a referendum to allow felons to vote, 64%. In 2020, 60% voted for a $15 minimum wage, which is like in Washington, oh, they'll never do that. that that's too out. So we're, we're putting our candidates in an election that favors by huge margins, not close, expanded voter access and a higher minimum wage. The only reason we lose there is we just run terrible campaigns. And, and of course, you, Grant Hill, he went to Duke, and then didn't his daddy go to Yale or something like that? You know, was, but, well, you know, why would Grant Hill be interested in politics? I have no idea, but at times he's not going to run. Well, he's lived down there for 20 years, though. I mean, he hasn't. And, and his wife. No, but he, it's life. not going to happen. Very, very so nice you're right. man. Right, 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 right. I do. But it, it's a, but, but the, the thing is, is, there's no reason we should be getting beat like we're getting beat in Florida. It, it really isn't. And, I, I, you know, those two candidates you mentioned, I think either one of them would be great. Uh, you know, Bill Nelson lost that Senate seat by 10,000 votes. I, I, just not, I don't know why we should give up on Florida. I have no idea. I, I, you yeah. know, we've got to get a good right. candidate, and maybe one of those two would be fine. <laughs> but that, that, it's the a government, question that actually the, troubles me. Yeah, it's a state. It really, it, it really has been a very second-rate state party, uh, as opposed to some places, and uh, that that's where part of the problem lies. At least they don't generate. So you know, maybe maybe it'll change. But those two candidates would be good. Maybe one runs for the Senate, one runs against DeSantis for governor. James uh, uh, Don in Scarborough, Maine, says Susan Collins bills herself as Mez Money Penny. She's posting and boasting about every federal dollar that comes into the state as if she were the sole source. What can Manners do to pressure her to vote yes? Um, go ahead, James, you take that. Well, first of all, you got to just look back and say, she's a hell of a politician. I mean, she's been there forever. She always gives the Democrats and the press a head fake. They always fall for it. All right, didn't we always think that we're going to beat her? And we do no such thing. 
And she's just become a master. And of course, she's going to take credit for everything that comes out of, just like the rest of them are out of this and, you know, very deftly say, well, I'm concerned. She's always concerned. She, she botches her eyebrows. She's a very concerned lady. She's very concerned during the Trump administration. She's very concerned about everything. But I, I have to give Senator Collins credit. She, she is a, a, a very concerned but very successful politician. She was at the very top of the Democrats' target list in 2000. And, and 20, if they were to list the three Senate seats they were most likely to win, she clearly would have been one of them. Uh, she trailed for a long time, but you're right. She's a heck of a candidate. I think usually when the chips are down, uh, she goes with Mitch McConnell, but, uh, but, but she sells it well. And I hate to tell Dom, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do to bring pressure on Susan Collins at this stage. She's got, she got, what, five and a half more years. Uh, Carol in Geneva, Switzerland. Boy, we're getting oh, wow. a good global outreach wow. today. Man, huh? What a cool place. She says, day. I worked at the World Health Organization for 23 years. She recently retired. Uh, and I know that WHO and other uh, UN agencies have flaws like most. But working inside, I saw how much vital work they did. What's your perspective of the value of international organizations? And why do some Americans seem so allergic to them? The value is enormous. And what we have to understand is they are this, that. They are international organizations. We don't have the sole vote at the UN or at the WHO or at other places. So sometimes we have to compromise our wishes. But we are much better off with them than without them, given all their flaws. Uh, and uh, the UN was created after World War II. There was a reason Sure, there's a lot of bureaucracy there and a lot of silliness there sometimes and a lot of blustering and fussing. But there are peacekeepers all over the world. The WHO, I think, has raised very important issues in healthcare, And Americans have to understand that we are much better off when we're joined with others than when we go it alone. Well, I, you know, we, our position is always, yeah, they, they messed up, but we need them. I don't know if the WHO in, in the sort of pantheon of, of international organizations from, you know, the Olympic Committee to the Red Cross to it's, it's any worse or any, you know, I think if anything, it's probably a little bit better. But we mm -hmm. always have to admit that, yeah, they, they're messed up, but, but at the end of the day, we need them. I think there's a lot of sort of real expertise at the WHO. And as long as the virus, the virus is not – it. It doesn't need a passport. It, it doesn't have to cross the Rio Grande. It just goes wherever it wants to go. And uh, of course, I, I commend you on your 20 year career there. Uh, and I think that what you're going to see coming out of this, at least what I hope, is a kind of renewed support for global health. Because we now know that we're not isolated from any of this stuff at all. And you look at what's happening around the world. So, I, yeah, I, th I think on the whole, I don't know a whole lot about it, but it seems like a, a, a pretty good organization. And, you know, of course, they got to respond to the realities of, of different funding countries. But I'm glad we're part of it, and I hope we stay there. Yeah. James, uh, I love this. This is Brendan in Apex, North Carolina. And even though the basic question has been asked before, I'm going to read Brendan's question. He said, I'm not sure who I'm a bigger fan of, your weekly podcast, or you all turning me on to the amazing Magic Spoon cereals. <laughs> I have to say, Cookies and Cream has become my favorite. Any pull with the company to make this a permanent flavor. I want you to hear this, uh, Magic Spoon. Do it for Brendan in Apex, North Carolina. His question is, he's increasingly concerned about the rapid push, he says, to move left. And are you worried... James, about the pen, about pending civil war within the Democratic Party and losing potential voter supporters with poor messaging. I, I, I guess I am, although the, the left keeps changing. Yeah. I, I'm, just if you look at the, the dramatic changes that, that the Biden administration has gone, we're doing these massive spending programs, and they're not even considered particularly far left now. And what's really remarkable uh, is the most effective critique of the largest expansion of federal spending since the Great Depression of World War II has been Larry Summers. I mean, the Republicans really don't have a coherent critique of this. It was Larry's critique 
that got the most generated the most talk and the most well, gee, I wonder if he's right. I haven't heard anything from the Heritage Foundation or the Cato people or the Wall Street Journal editorial page or, or anything where you generally, you know, they generally organize and they come up with all these cockamamie ideas that they have. They've been totally off guard. And it's been an amazing thing to see. Is that this is a huge, un- unheralded expansion of federal spending. And they don't really have much to say about it. It, it, yeah. it. It's an amazing time in American politics. I'm not sure I ever thought I'd see this. Yeah, you're right. Uh, they have all they have is cancel culture and uh, you know Sen- other senility. Uh, I watch yeah. them all the time. Right, man, Biden is seen now. Like that they're riding that they're, they're right. riding that horse. Ooh, man, you haven't That's seen it. those those uh, extraordinarily in depth pieces that Fox News has done on Matt Getz. No, I, somehow you no, missed them. No, yeah, I, I, my friends at Media Matters, I think, missed them too because they had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, this goes to the next question, which is uh, coming from Peter in Newmarket, Ontario, uh, because instead they're focusing on AOC. He wants to know why moderate Democrats dislike AOC and her progressive policies. Uh, aren't they exactly what white blue collar workers really need? Uh, isn't and she really laying out the right agenda? for working class Democrats. Um, Peter, let me say this. I think the agenda probably goes too far, but she talks about a lot of important things. Uh, and I think uh, she's a, I think she's a really constructive force, even though I disagree with some of what she says and espouses. And people talk, they create this incredible false equivalency of the left-wing Democrats and the right-wing Republicans. Well, I'm sorry. She's not advocating going out and uh, uh, killing people. She's not advocating going out and defending a mob assault on the Capitol. She has views. She wants socialized medicine. I don't think that's practical or reasonable, but it's at least part of any discussion one ought to have. So I'm, I'm an AOC fan with some caveats. James. Yeah. I mean, I, I think she's probably a different generation than me and everything else. I think she's kind of very savvy. I think she's ambitious, which I, I sort of like in, in any politician. I guess I'm like a soft spot for ambitious female politicians. Uh, and the worst thing you can say about it is she's kind of naive and she's got a kind of worldview that is just not practical in the United States and is, you know, it's very urban centric and it doesn't account. And okay, that's fine. You can make that critique of anybody. The Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Bobbitt, uh, Andy Biggs, Matt Gates, they're out of their minds. They're not like have some like, oh, unbelievable faith in, you know, tax cuts for the rich producing something. They're nuts. They're nuts. And any, anybody who listens to this program and say, well, you got AOC and you, you got Marjorie Taylor Greene, stop. They are not even comparable, not remotely comparable in the conversation, because that's what everybody wants to say. Yeah, they got their crazies, and they got their crazies. And you know what we need is something. And then that's the most dangerous crap you can hear. So I agree with you on that, your analysis. Yeah. James, finally, uh, this is good. Barb in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is to you. She said, you wanted either a 20-point zag win or a buzzer beater. She wants to know if you're happy now. But she also says, please uh, connect predict who takes gets a seat in Florida. Well, it'll be a Republican, so you can go there if you want to, but I don't think it gets as far. But this is the good one. Give us again your perfect tuna fish sandwich recipe. Please, please, I did not write it down the first time. Okay, very good. Well, you, you got me going. First of all, I just want to make one comment about the game. Baylor is like the most prestigious Baptist university in the country. Gonzaga is a Jesuit school. I don't even remember. I mean, compared to like 40 years ago or 30 years ago, it would have been the Catholics and the Baptists. It would have been some kind of a religious war in Indianapolis. No one even mentioned that. Right. I never, no one said it's, it's, it's a historically Baptist institution playing a, a historically a, a Jesuit school. And I, I think that really represents something that's a significant change in American culture. And the truth of the matter is, I grew up Catholic. I used to always, Notre Dame would play SMU. I was so into Notre Dame and everything. I was actually kind of pulling for Baylor. 
And it's, you know, Gonzaga was the, you know, they, they got a buzzer beat in, I mean, not a buzzer beat, but they, yeah, I guess it was a buzzer beat in overtime. Yeah. And, but I, it wasn't remarkable that I was. I, I didn't, you know, once they, you know, they were just good. I mean, that, that game was no fluke. They beat the living crap out of Gonzaga. Oh, boy, did they ever. And they, I mean, they did it the old fashioned way. I mean, they played defense, they swarmed, they did anything. And, and congratulations to Baylor University. You, you, you really, deserve to be where you are and you, there's no doubt you beat a lot of all right teams. james the big question from barb please again the perfect right. tuna fish sandwich recipe okay. barb you got to write right. it down this time okay all right so barb only use wild planet tuna no other tuna exists all right wash your hands like you just changed the diaper all right i mean wash them good then take that wild planet tuna and just take it in your fingers and just crumble it as fine as you can after you do that then give five good squirts of Lee and Perrin, maybe seven, a little more black pepper than you think, and a good quarter cup of lemon juice, maybe a third a cup of lemon juice. And then take that and mix it with your really washed hands. All right, then put more celery and finely chopped celery and red onion than you think you need. Throw that in there. Throw a pretty big glob of mayo and about one fourth a glob of, of gluten's mustard, and just take that with the, with your washed hands. And don't you got to use your hands? Don't don't try tongs any of that crap because you washed your hands like like your Dr. Fauci cleaning his grandchild's baby, right? And just mix that with your hands. Look at the texture. I like to take some like finely chopped chives and put them on top just to give it a little color appeal. But you're never going to eat tuna fish like that again for the rest of your life. And I'd, I'd use high quality mayonnaise. I mean, uh, you like blue plate down here, but the almonds would be just fine. But that's what you got to do. You got to get it really fine. You need to take it out with a combination of lemon juice, Worcestershire sauce, black pepper, more finely chopped red onions and celery than you think because you want some crunch in background. Probably three to one, four to one, four to one mayo to spicy mustard combo and you're ready to go okay and barb i want you to write us tell us what a big hit it was in albuquerque you can bring the whole town in to eat james's special tuna fish use your hands uh, bob use your hands they, they and wash them. Gave them to you for a reason. <laughs> wash them good you can All even right. put on one of those little gloves if you, if, if, if you saw the, lose your hands we use our hands so we don't we don't care but some people well, well, like I can't do, touch anything in my hands. So well, then put put some gloves on and do it. Doesn't matter. But you gotta you gotta get that stuff as close to powder as you can. I just I don't know why I have this adversion of big chunks of tuna fish in my tuna salad. But I'm passionate about tuna salad. So. Okay, Barb, you hear it? You wrote it down this time. Go back, and and we're counting on hearing from you. Hey, we've got a great new sponsor, Songfinch. You can create a personalized radio quality song full of details about your life or that of a loved one. I think about it. It's the perfect gift for your mom, your wife, or an important person in your life. Simply share a few details about them, what makes them so special to you or your special memories together. And a hand-picked professional artist will turn it into a song that can be treasured forever. I did that last week, and have a listen to what they put together for me. Remember Carter playing ball at the Georgia field? All I know is that day I found something real I wouldn't be the man I am today If you never had looked my way When I saw those eyes, everything had changed Hey James, I was a bit skeptical. The song about my wife uh, and was last Friday our 41st wedding anniversary was a Monday. I thought, Ooh, maybe I can, you know, get away with uh, giving her, I took her out for dinner and our producer wanted me to give her land, which I couldn't afford to do. So I thought, well, we'll see how this song works. It, they came back Monday, the day of our anniversary. It was fabulous. It was, I don't know what I expected, but this was 10 times greater. And and even more amazing, my wife loved it. So uh, all, you, all I did was I told them where we met, which was the Plains Georgia softball field, as they captured in the song. Uh, what my great memories of her, uh, a song about us, our kids. 
Boy, they are, you know, you got to do it for Mary. Uh, you know, my kids they say that, Daddy, you have a voice like Goose Boy. Yeah. So uh, apparently these people are substantially better than Goose. I'm going to try it. And it's just the, the creativity of this whole thing is, is amazing because everybody likes songs. Just very few people can actually sing a right one. And I, I'm going to try this. This sounds like a, a fabulous, fun post pandemic project. I, I might get them to do one about me. You, you know, it looks uh, so far so good. You got through this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I didn't know what to expect. It was off the charts great. And I'm like you. My wife one time asked me to stop singing in church. So it's amazing. Songfinch uses professional artists that have been seen on hit shows like Songland uh, and The Voice to make them so good and it sounds so good. Songs are $249. But this week, they're offering $50 off, bringing that to $199 with the code WARROOM. That's W-A-R-R-O-O-M, and you save another 20. That's a total of $70 off the perfect gift for a loved one, a spouse, a friend, a mom, or anything. $179 is a gift they're going to treasure forever. It doesn't go away. And the best part is you can visit songfinch.com and use code WARROOM for that additional 20 bucks off. you got to do it. Songfinch is offering $20 off all personalized song at songfinch.com with code WARROOM. I'm repeating this because it's so good. Visit songfinch.com, that's S-O-N-G-F-I-N-C-H.com, and use code WARROOM, that's W-A-R-R-O-O-M, all one word, or look for the link in our show notes. You will love this. Okay, James, now for the outrage of this week. You know, instead of an outrage, I'm going to offer praise with a spin. Three cheers for former Republican House Speaker John Boehner, who in his new memoir flatly accuses Trump of inciting the bloody January 6th attack on the Capitol as he was trying to peddle, to quote Boehner, the bullshit he had been shoveling that he lost the election because of voter fraud. He betrayed the trust of those who supported him. And as Boehner says, instead of a wake-up call, though, Republicans are doubling down. They're dominating, as, again, the former Republican speaker says, with whack jobs. Exhibit A, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the QAnon-loving new congressman from Georgia. She raised $3.2 million in the first quarter, duping regular folks with her crazy conspiracies like QAnon's charge, Democrats are running a massive pedophilia ring, or Nancy Pelosi should be tried, maybe executed for treason. John Boehner got it right. These whack jobs are bullshit, and I hope the voters continue to realize that because they really are dangerous. Well, okay, I'll take off of this because my outrage is our Republican House speakers. All right, and of the whole sorry lot, and I got to tell you, it's a really sorry lot. Boehner stands out like a then he giant of redwood in this forest of toothpicks. So we tend to forget this. Who is the longest Republican House Speaker in history? <clears throat> that would be Denny Hassel. And I can go show you columns written by intelligent people saying Coach Hassett's going to be, you know, he's going to get off the sort of Clintonian blah, 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 and he's Coach Hassett and all of that shit I had to read. Where's Coach What happened to Coach Hassett? We don't talk about Coach Hassett anymore. He was the favorite. He was going to bring a new thing. You know, of course, he followed none other than Newt Gingrich. He reportedly had, a, who had an affair. Some people will say arguably one of the most immoral people right. in the history of American right. politics. Right. And, what, ha and briefly, what happened Bob to Denny Hassett, so you, you James? From, from Ted Tinkers to Evans to Chance, you had Gingrich to Livingston to Hassett. Right? That just happened. Uh, apparently, he was a wrestling coach that got very involved with some of the young wrestlers. Right? To, to say the least. He's in a good was, and maybe he's out now. The penitentiary for trying to pay people off for molesting young kids. His name is never spoken. 
never spoken. All right, we still are having a hissy fit about Bill Clinton's consensual sex. Oh my God, what a good idea, all right? This was never spoken. Livingston had to leave because it was a lobbyist, all right? We know, we know about Gingrich and all, all of his exploits. Um, Paul Ryan was just, you know, so, I mean, Boehner was, was a nice guy. Why didn't he say something when all this was going on? You know, why, why, did, why didn't you say something? You, these people were nuts that came in in 2010. They were nuts when they came in in 2014. You wanted to, you know, obviously like any other politician, you want to stay there and understand that. Yeah, I wish he would have. Now, he did say, I mean, I remember he called Jim Jordan a legislative terrorist and said the Freedom Caucus was destructive. But yeah, uh, there should have been more. But I welcome this book. I welcome what he's saying now. Uh, and uh, I hope that message uh, gets around because he is a good messenger for this. He is a, a, a nice guy. I've met him several times. I like him. He is by <laughs> far and away the greatest Republican House Speaker of my lifetime. And that might be the easiest. It wasn't, it wasn't Jim world. Martin. It was, I can't remember his name now, but yeah, Bob Michael. Bob Michael never got to be speaker. I know he never got to be speaker. It was Joe Martin. It was Joe Martin, right back in. That was right after we were. Whatever his name was, but but Bob was never speaker, right? But but Speaker Boehner, you are the greatest Republican speaker of my lifetime, which has now unfortunately spanned seventy six years. My hats off to you. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you'd check out the links to our sponsors. Blinkist, Hello Fresh, and Songfinch. We deeply thank you for supporting them. When you help them, it makes this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.